Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the podcast about Texas history, culture, and everything Texan. I'm your host, Ken Wise. We're putting this episode out near November 3rd, which is Election Day here in Texas. I picked this day on purpose for this episode because Texas has a long history of colorful elections, and they always make good stories. We'll certainly cover many of them during the course of this podcast, but we're going to start with one of our most famous elections, one that led directly to the election of a president of the United States and changed our national history forever. That's the U.S. Senate election of 1948. So let's go back to the 40s and get wise about Texas. Back in 1941, on August the 4th, there was a special election for one of our senators because of the death of Senator Andrew Jackson Houston, who happened to be the son of San Jacinto hero Sam Houston. The governor then, Wilbert Lee Pappy O'Daniel, entered the race against, among others, a New Deal congressman from the Hill Country named Lyndon Baines Johnson. By the way, this race was a Democratic primary because, since Texas was essentially a one-party state, whomever won the Democrat primary almost certainly would win the general election. O'Daniel won that race with a controversial flood of late election returns that came in and handed him the election. Before that Senate election, Governor O'Daniel had run for governor in 1938. He did so by hitting the road with a band, a Bible, and an affected hillbilly personality. He wasn't even born in Texas, as a matter of fact. And he also had a professional public relations man directing all of those efforts. By the way, his band was called the Light Crust Doughboys, although he called them the Hillbilly Boys on the campaign trail. One of the members of that band was a fiddle player you may have heard of named Bob Wills. Later on, there was a lawsuit between Wills and O'Daniel that we'll talk about perhaps in a music episode. His campaign was considered almost vaudevillian, and he certainly was one of the first candidates to ever use media, specifically radio, and a show business attitude to win an election. Oh, what a trend he started these days. It worked, and he was elected governor in 1938, but what he really wanted was that Senate seat. He hit the road during that 1941 special election, utilizing the same tactics that he had used in his gubernatorial election. Those tactics, coupled with the interesting flurry of late election returns, resulted in Governor O'Daniel being elected to the Senate. He was later re-elected in the regular election of 1942, but was going to retire after his first term in office. So the 1948 Senate election in Texas would be for an open seat. The governor in 1948 was O'Daniel's lieutenant governor, Coke Stevenson. Governor Stevenson was born in a log cabin in Mason County and grew up in Junction, Texas. He entered the Senate race in 1948, riding a wave of popularity from his gubernatorial service and no doubt was a favor to win that election. Now, one of his opponents, Lyndon Johnson, was then a popular congressman from the 10th Congressional District, which was in the central part of Texas. He must have learned something from his 1941 run against Pappy O'Daniel because he hit the trail hard. Now let me say a word about coming at a statewide race as a governor versus coming at it as a congressman. A congressman represents a district which consists of a piece of the state, but naturally not the whole state. Johnson had not been on the ballot in Texas statewide except for that one losing effort in 1941. Stevenson, however, had been elected lieutenant governor, which is also a statewide position, and he'd also, by that time, been elected governor twice. So voters all across the state were very familiar with Coke Stevenson's name, which makes a difference in later elections. So Johnson had a disadvantage on this front as well. Now, one way a congressman can overcome this is to call on his fellow congressman from Texas and try to activate their various political operations in favor of their colleague. So come the 1948 senatorial election, the battle was joined. In the 1948 primary, there were more than just Coke Stevenson and Lyndon Johnson. In fact, there were 11 candidates in that primary, and plus one person that got a write-in vote. Johnson campaign, campaigned feverishly in that primary and actually employed a helicopter to fly around to various events, which in 1948 Texas had never, ever been done. No doubt he also drew a lot of attention just flying it around. The Associated Press dubbed the helicopter the Johnson Windmill. Now, there are a couple of cute stories about Johnson and his windmill. One time they were flying, and Johnson saw some railroad workers working on a track. 
He ordered his pilot to set the helicopter down. He jumped out, passed out his pamphlets, shook hands, and got back in and flew off. Another time in East Texas, he was flying over a cotton field being worked by the field hands. He had his pilot wheel the helicopter around and come in, at which point the field hands dropped their tools and fled in terror. Before they could get to the safety of the trees, however, Johnson's voice came booming over the helicopter loudspeaker telling him to be sure and vote for their friend, Lyndon Johnson. His pilot one time was asked how many times he had to set that helicopter down during the campaign, and he said any time there were two people and a big dog. And I used to go to church with a former congressman from Corpus Christi named John Lyle who once told President Johnson that that helicopter sure made a lot of noise. Johnson said, yeah, but it sure got me a lot of votes. Stevenson, on the other hand, uh, relied on his popularity as a governor and didn't really actively campaign. Up until the 1948 election, the tradition really was to campaign by going to the various county seats in the state and making speeches at the courthouse. And from there, you'd basically rely on word of mouth to get the word out about your campaign. Now, when the votes were tallied, Stevenson and Johnson had emerged as the two highest vote getters, which meant they were going to go to a runoff election. Despite not actively campaigning, Stevenson's name ID resulted in a lead over Johnson by a little more than 70,000 votes after that first round of voting. The runoff turned out to be similar in that Johnson campaigned very hard and Stevenson really relied on his name ID. Now, this is not all that surprising because, again, Johnson was behind behind name ID front, needing to build it outside of just his congressional district, whereas Stevenson had it statewide. The runoff was going to take place on Saturday, August 28, 1948. Now, the way they had election returns in those days, they would obtain the um, election returns by phone from the various voting precincts. Paper ballots were used in most of the rural areas of Texas. This was before the widespread use of voting machines and way before the electronic voting equipment that we use now in Texas. So instant election returns were not really available. In fact, it would take days to get all the final returns in. Stevenson, while they were calculating returns, Stevenson led Johnson by varying margins until six days later on the following Friday when 201 votes came in from Precinct 13 in Jim Wells County. Jim Wells County is in South Texas, so we need to talk a little bit about what elections were like in South Texas in 1948. In South Texas back then, political power was concentrated in the hands of a few political bosses, and politics was very violent in that area of Texas. On election day, armed men, usually made deputy sheriffs for the day by the boss, would herd the people to the polls and hand out their poll tax receipts as they came in to vote. Now, back then we had a poll tax, so you had to have a receipt to vote. The boss would have paid the poll tax and kept the receipt, uh, of course, for safekeeping. Sometimes ballots were handed out that had already been marked for the boss's preferred candidate, and the number of votes that a boss could deliver did not always match the number of registered voters. Senior citizens didn't pay a poll tax, and the voter rolls weren't often checked or revised to eliminate people from the rolls who had died. Therefore, the boss could vote for the dead people, too. Arguably, the most powerful boss in South Texas was a guy named George Burham Parr. He had inherited the title of the Duke of Duval County from his father, political boss Archer Parr, Duval County neighbor, Jim Wells County. And by the way, decades earlier, just to give you an example, one of Archer Parr's political rivals was shot in the back back while he was eating lunch. So politics was rough and tumble. Anyway, George Parr ran the show down there. A word from him and you could lose your job or even worse. In fact, he probably deserves his own episode of Wise About Texas. Parr's reach extended beyond his home county of Duval, however. In Jim Wells County, he had an enforcer named Luis Salas. Salas was feared because he was very short-tempered, a large man, and very strong. His nickname was Indio. Indio carried a gun, and he always had plenty of George Parr's money to throw around. He also made sure Jim Wells County voted the way George Parr wanted it to vote. When asked later about the 1948 election, Luis Salas remembered Parr telling him to concentrate on the Senate race and be sure we elect Johnson. So basically, the election had been decided for Stevenson on the official returns until those 201 votes turned it for Johnson. 
Now, of the 201 votes that came in, 200 were for Johnson and one vote was for Stevenson. We don't know who that is. The voting records back then consisted of tally sheets for the voters, but also a voter sign-in sheet. The voters supposedly signed in as they appeared at the poll to vote. Well, the sign-in sheet for Precinct 13 in Jim Wells County is interesting because the number 765, Johnson's votes, on the top of the tally sheet had been altered to read 965. The sign-in sheet for the extra 200 votes revealed that all the voters had voted in alphabetical order. So either the voters lined up in alphabetical order or something fishy was going on. The extra names were also written in a different color ink from the election day sign-ins. Now, some people are of the opinion that Johnson didn't really cheat Stevenson out of the election. He merely out-cheated him. But nevertheless, Johnson had the lead. And Stevenson was, as you might imagine, fairly upset. Now, they were facing a deadline to get on the general election ballot. The Democrats were going to convene, and the convention was going to nomin- officially nominate the candidate to the ballot. So if Stevenson was going to contest this election, he had to act fast. And this is the part of the story that isn't told very often. So let me tell you what happened next. Stevenson assembled a team of lawyers and began an investigation. Some lawyers went to the neighboring Duval County, which was the home of political boss George Parr, and they started interviewing residents. Some people said that they hadn't voted, but rather had given their poll tax receipts to other people who cast the ballots for them. Unfortunately, no notary in the entire county was willing to attest to those statements. At one point, some Duval County Sheriff's deputies put those lawyers up against the wall, searched them, and gave them a half hour to get the heck out of Duval County, which wisely they did. The lawyers who went to Jim Wells County, the site of the soon-to-be infamous Precinct 13, noticed several rough-looking characters walking around the streets of Alice, which was the county seat, with pistols and rifles. They went to the bank where the election documents were stored and asked to see them, which they were allowed to do by law. Any citizen was allowed to see the sign-in sheets and the tally sheets. The bank officer, who was also the election clerk, politely informed them that certainly they could see the documents except for one problem. They were stored in the vault, and he didn't feel like unlocking the vault at this time. So... That led uh, that little incident led Governor Stevenson himself to go down to Alice, but he didn't go alone. Governor Stevenson was friends with a very famous former Texas Ranger named Frank Hamer. He took Ranger Hamer with him, and you might m- remember Frank Hamer's name. Among other notable events, he was the officer who led the chase and eventual killing of the famous outlaws Bonnie and Clyde and had quite the reputation in Texas. He and Stevenson met Stevenson's lawyers in Alice and marched down the street to the bank. They managed to get a look at the voting records, but as soon as they started taking notes, the folks at the bank grabbed the documents and invited them to leave. They did manage to get enough names to do a little investigation, however. When they did that, they learned that some of the folks that were listed on the sheet didn't actually vote. They also discovered that some of the folks listed on the sheet not only didn't vote, but they were dead. So Stevenson had a decision to make. He persuaded the state Democrat committee to call for an investigation of the election irregularities. And shortly after finding out that an investigation had been called, Lyndon Johnson sprang into action and filed a lawsuit. He sued Stevenson. He sued Frank Hamer. He sued the other lawyers, alleging that they were trying to monkey with the election results. Importantly, though, for our purposes, he asked the court for a restraining order to prevent Stevenson and his team from altering the results. Now, I won't dive too much into the technical weeds of this lawsuit, but there are a couple of interesting observations about it. First, Johnson filed the lawsuit in Austin, which is Travis County, as opposed to Jim Wells County, which is where the events occurred. The clerk's file stamp on Johnson's petition, which I have personally looked at, says it was filed at 9.50 p.m., which is a long time after any courthouse would close. The restraining order was stamped, granted, at 9.55 p.m., five minutes later. So there wasn't much of a hearing on that temporary restraining order. The restraining order also set the next hearing to occur in Jim Wells County on the following Monday. The lawsuit was filed on a Friday, by the way. 
Now that's an unusual set of circumstances. There's also a note in the court file that the case was then transferred to Jim Wells County at the request of the plaintiff, the person bringing the lawsuit, which is also fairly unheard of. Somebody must have taken the file to Jim Wells County over the weekend because they had the hearing in Alice, Texas the following Monday, and reportedly political boss George Parr himself came into the courtroom and sat in Lyndon Johnson's table. In the meantime, the State Democratic Executive Committee, which is the group that would decide who's on the November ballot, was moving forward with its election investigation. That committee voted to put Johnson on the ballot by a vote of 29 to 28. So at that point, Stevenson beefed up his legal team by adding a former governor named Dan Moody. Now, Dan Moody was famous for exposing the corruption of former Texas Governor Ma Ferguson and also uh, successfully prosecuted the Ku Klux Klan in the 20s. So Stevenson added Governor Moody to his legal team, and they filed a suit in federal court. Now, they also got a restraining order, and the federal judge agreed with Stevenson and indicated that the alleged election fraud needed to be investigated. Johnson moved to stay that order so that the state Democrat committee could go ahead and certify the ballot with his name on it. So with each passing day, Stevenson's chances of being on the ballot were lessening. Now, I will mention one thing about that federal lawsuit. Those, so we had a state lawsuit brought by Johnson and a federal lawsuit brought by Stevenson. The federal lawsuit went all the way to the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, Stevenson had to go through the Fifth Circuit, uh, which was not in session, by locating uh, Judge Joseph Hutchison, who was in Houston. Hutchison refused to rule. He then went to Justice Hugo Black of the U.S. Supreme Court, at his house over a weekend to get him to try to stay Johnson's efforts on the state level. He eventually lost in the federal court. The Democrat Executive Committee certified the ballot with Lyndon Johnson's name on it, and the result of all of that litigation, of course, was to pave the way to the presidency for Lyndon Johnson. He later went on to become what was described as the master of the Senate during his years in the Senate and famous for the Johnson treatment where he would get right in your face and convince you to see things his way. John Kennedy picked him as his running mate. 